Ports of Call. blue horizons far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Ports of Call. Sailing southward among the palm-lined islands of the Blue Caribbean Sea, we approach the northern coast of South America and head for tropical Guiana, containing the only European possessions on the continent. The vast, steaming jungle stretching inland for miles is intersected by innumerable streams and drenched by huge waterfalls. In the dense undergrowth, trees struggle for life, their limbs covered with orchids and festooned with vines. The jungle is alive with the chatter of monkeys, the cries of brilliant birds. Great anacondas lie motionless for hours, awaiting their prey. Deadly bushmasters dart among the roots. Farther inland, in a region that even today no man has explored, the inaccessible mountains lift their heads. Our steamer passes the lightship, marking the bar ten miles out of Georgetown, capital of British Guiana. Only at high tide can the harbor be entered. As the sun sets, we drop anchor. Well, son, here we are. We wanted to see the tropics. Yes, Ted, but the only thing I know about Guiana is that they have a postage stamp worth (laughs) $50,000. They don't have that anymore. I think the King of England has the only one in the world. No use for me to try and find one then, I suppose. See, look at those houses. They're all built on stilts. Yes, to keep out the dampness. Well, we can't see the botanical gardens from here. Come on, let's go ashore. You've got your camera? I certainly have. If they really do raise those water lilies with leaves four feet across, I'm not going to run the risk of having people at home say I made it up. Come on, Dad. The efforts of Europeans have pushed the jungle back from the sea in some places along the Guiana coast. Georgetown's wide, clean streets and gay gardens might almost be those of a European city, except for the ever-present jungle that presses down toward the coast like some crouching animal waiting its moment to spring. Columbus sighted Guiana, and America's Vespucia sailed along its coast. But it was almost a hundred years later that the first daring explorers ventured to land. It is the year 1595. Under a commission from Queen Elizabeth, Sir Walter Raleigh sails down the Guiana coast, seeking the legendary golden city of El Dorado. He anchors near the mouth of the Orinoco River and embarks with his party in small boats. For 15 days, they row upstream through the humid jungle, not daring to land. In relays, they relieve each other at the oars. Then, one night... Captain Raleigh, sir, village to starboard. I see it. Inside of us, Raleigh. Shall we risk a landing? 
I've heard that poisoned arrows cause horrible death. Yes, we'll chance it. Hard to starboard, men. And remember, there is to be no looting. Right, Up on the beach, men. Your <laughs> <laughs> men from beyond the seas are very welcome. Joe, he speaks English. Peace to this village. And to you and your men, peace. My men are weary and hungry. Can you sell us food? You and your men are welcome to eat and drink with my people. I will pay for whatever food my men eat. At ease, men. How does it happen you speak our tongue? I learned it from a man who lived in this village for many moons. Who was he? Where is he now? He called himself John. He is dead. But who do you suppose you could have been, Larry? Probably a trader, lost in the jungle. Must have been. Can you tell us how far we are from Guiana? Yeah, this land is a part of Guiana. And is there much gold to be found here? The city of El Dorado is built of gold, and the bed of Lake Manoa is golden sand. Can you show us the way? I cannot go with you, but there is something I may do. Will you hear it now or wait until you have eaten? No, no, uh, tell us now. The mountain men steal our women. If you help us fight them, you shall have the gold and the gray metal and the brilliant pebbles from the mountain of crystal. Gold, silver, diamonds. Uh, how many men would be needed? Ten times as many as these would be too few. What shall you do, Walter? Do? There is only one thing to do. Go back to England and tell the story to the Queen. Set out a great fleet of ships and return here. We will defeat Guiana's warriors and win the Golden City for Elizabeth and England. But Raleigh returns to a war-torn England. Elizabeth dies. James sends Raleigh to the Tower. Thirteen years pass before he can be freed to stake his whole future on a successful expedition to Guiana. Ten ships manned by the scum of English ports, criminals, cutthroats, good-for-nothings, sail from Plymouth. Six months later, five of them anchor off the Guiana coast. One, Raleigh's own ship, the Destiny. Raleigh is ill with fever. A Spanish ship off the port bow, sir! Now look outside the Spanish ship, sir! Let it pass unmolested, Gilbert. But it may be filled with Spanish treasures, Sir Walter. I will tell you why I have refused to attack the Spanish ships we have already sighted. His Majesty ordered that if I violate the peace with Spain, I will be turned over to King Philip himself and hanged in a public square in Madrid. Is that enough for you, Gilbert? There's a boat setting up from shore, Bobber. Shall I allow the men to come aboard? How many men? Two, an oarsman and a passenger. Uh, let them come aboard. It may be a messenger from Tapiawari. Impossible. How could he know when we'd arrive? Line up the landing party, Gilbert. See that the boats are provisioned and be ready to go ashore when I give the word. Aye, aye, sir. You're too ill to go ashore, Walter. Must I sit here idle while you and young Walter lead the men through the jungle? What else is there to do? The men may mutiny if we delay. <sighs> My father's waiting for you down there. Oh, father, this man is Juan Martinez. A Spaniard? I have been awaiting your coming, Sir Walter. How did you know of it? A word has come from Spain. What? Are Spanish soldiers here? They were here, senor, but they have gone. For a petty offense, I was abandoned in the jungle among the wild animals and serpents. If I had not made friends among the savages, I would have died. I have come to help you, senor. To help us? Si, sí, senor. The village chief, Tapiawari, is dead. But he sent me to lead you through the mountains to El Dorado, the city of gold. For I am one who has seen it. Huh? You've seen Where it? Is... Tell us. I was taken there by a native who blindfolded me for many days before we arrived. The emperor, who is brother to the Inca chief, possesses more gold than his brother ever knew. A man may walk for two days together without coming to the boundaries of the city in which everything is overlaid with gold. You will permit me to guide your men to El Dorado, senor? Yes. Yes, the party must start at once. But, Father, you're not fit to travel. Your yes, people... I know, I know. Duenquimis will lead the men. I 
I must wait here until you return. Oh, yes, Father. To the boat's men. We're off for Israel. How much farther to the village, Kibis? Not much farther now. But I don't like the sounds we've heard from shore. The jungle growth could screen an army, and we'd be none the wiser. You're right, Kimus. A party and ball, men. Yes. Return the fire. No, no. Let no man dare to fire. It will cost your father's life if we fire on them, and they're Spaniards. Pull harder, men. Aye, aye, sir. We must reach the village. Harder, men. How far to the village? Just around this bend. Harder, men. Here we are, on the beach, men! It's the Spaniards! Oh, Don't just let us now! Peter, John, Alfred! Come on, the rest of you, let them go! Oh! Walter, my boy, you've been hit! Go on! Go on, lead me. My son, we did our best rally. They cut us to pieces. I carried him into the jungle and buried him there. So here you all are now, the captains of my ships. Well, well, this is a council of war. What is proposed? Captain Hayward and I are leaving your fleet, Sir Walter. We're going to try our hand at buccaneering. No, you mustn't do that. We must go back into the jungle. We must have the gold at any cost. I, I leave you myself. The provisions are almost gone. We're all half-starved. I'm sailing back for England at the turn of the tide today. Today? Without even a handful of gold? I, without a spoonful. My men are at the point of mutiny. The Spanish treasure fleet will be passing this way soon, and I mean to waylay it and get my share. And I... Go then. All of you go. I want none of your company. I'll sail the destiny back to England alone. <laughs> And so the fabulous golden city of Guyana went undiscovered. And in the vast jungles, the puma and the jaguar killed, and the chattering monkeys swung from the trees, unmolested by white-faced strangers. But the rich land had won the attention of traders, and stories of its wonders had spread over Europe. In 1664, Lord Willoughby, an English planter, sits on the veranda of his house near the humid Guyana coast. His overseer stands before him. Sit down, Hendon. It's a bit too hot to... Stand on ceremony. Thank you, my lord. It's partly the heat I've come to see you about. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do about that, Hendon. Oh, quite, sir. I only meant you you lose too many laborers on the count of it. I know. But let's leave that for the moment. What about the sugar cane? Uh, it's doing very well, my lord. I made a small planting of a new strain I had from a Dutchman who called here last summer. And I think it's the best of the lot. Indeed? Yes, my lord. If we could find laborers, I'm sure you'd be well repaid by cutting back a bit of more of the jungle, you know, and planting it to cane. Oh, come, Hendon. It would want constant chopping and hacking, or the jungle would overrun the cane field. Ah, but we have bad labor, sir. Uh, no, but we haven't. That's the point. Uh, perhaps your partner could send out more men from England, sir. Well, perhaps. It's astonishing the natives can't be got to work the cane. Oh, it's no use thinking about the Indians, my lord. The moment you take your eyes off them, they sneak away and they'll never turn up again. I can't see the advantage of importing shipload after shipload of Englishmen, only to have them die of the heat in a few months. I agree, my lord. But I thought I should call your attention to the profits that might be made if some scheme could be devised to furnish labor. I appreciate your suggestion, Hendon. Lord knows you've done wonders with this wild land. Why doesn't the heat affect you? You dash about in it like a native. Perhaps because I have southern blood. My great-grandmother was stolen from her father in Constantinople by a Scotch sailor. Ah, I see. Well, I'll write Mr. Hyde an account of our progress and see if he can find us at least one more shipload of men. Yes, sir. Is that all? 
That's all, Hendon. No, wait a moment. What is it, Fernando? Master, a ship has anchored in the bay. A ship? An English ship? I do not know, Master. Well, has it a flag like the one that flies over this house? No, oh no, Master, it is not. Two colors, yellow and red? Uh, no, Master. Not Spanish, then? It is three colors, and the captain ordered me to come to you at once and say... There he is, no, my lord. We are party of armed men. And the flag of truce. By Jove, they must be Dutch. Shall I serve out the guns to the men? No, no, we're not equipped for fighting. Halt! You are Lord Willoughby? Yes. I am Captain Peter van Gilder, the Netherlands merchant ship Zealand. Oh, yes. Come up on the veranda, Captain. Oh, thank you. Fernando, bring us a jug of the spiced pineapple wine. Yes, master. This is my overseer, John Hendon. Oh, it is a pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank you, sir. No, if you gentlemen will excuse me. Certainly. Uh, sit down, please, Captain. Yeah. I'm glad you do not order your servants to shoot me because our country is at a war. I'm satisfied to be well out of it. Uh, if you'd like to send your men back to the ship, I'll have a servant to row you out when you're ready. Oh, you're very kind, Lord Willoughby. Uh, Puenco, take the men back to the boat. Yeah, yeah, my dear. Forward! Ah, here's the wine. Pour it out, Fernando. Yes. Your very good health, sir. Uh, thank you, my lord. Ah. Lord Willoughby, may I ask if you own this land? I own it with the Honorable Lawrence Hyde, son of the Earl of Clarendon. Oh, I had not realized your connections with the king were so close. I assure you, whatever you say to me will be held in the strictest confidence. Thank you. I came to see whether you'd be interested in laborers to work in your cane fields. You mean you know where they can be had? Yes, I do, my lord. Africa. Blacks? Yes, the African bush is teeming with men. Ships can be sent to bring them here several hundred at a time. As slaves? Exactly. So all their labor will cost you will be what food they eat, and that they can be taught to raise. I believe you've hit upon the very thing. Of course, it would not be profitable for me to import only a few hundred for this district alone. But down the coast, a few miles, is a Dutch settlement, and still farther down, a French one. And I would pay you a certain price per head. Are these men delivered here? Just so. Hmm. Are the Dutch and French also raising sugar cane in large quantities? Well, the Dutch are doing well. The French, as usual, have made little progress. But there will be a good market for blacks even there. I see. Then, uh, I may assume you will agree to give me an order for what men you will need? Indeed you may. How long will it take you to deliver them here? Uh, with favorable winds, perhaps three months. I'll make my plans accordingly. I think you will agree with me, too, that our dealings need not be reported to our governments during the war. I'm sure you're right. I'll not wait to consult my partner, because I know he'll trust my judgment. Uh, good, good. Fernando, for some more wine. Captain, let us drink to the success of our new venture. Uh. <laughs> Back and forth across the Atlantic plied the ships of Captain Van Gilder. The Guiana slave trade grew to enormous proportions. Thousands of Africans were poured into Guiana's fruitful acres. One morning in 1667, Captain Van Gilder lands as usual at Willoughby's plantation, walks up the path toward the house. Good morning, Captain Van Gilder. Oh, good morning, Hinton. Oh, what has happened? The work seems to be at a standstill this morning. Yes, it is, sir. The remain coming this way, sir. Oh. I saw two ships a short distance offshore about sunset yesterday. Not knowing what ships they might be, I sailed past and anchored in a cove to the west. Understand, but they say that you said they're no waiting for you to arrive before they begin the ceremony. Who? Why, what? Well, that's General Van Ryan of the Dutch Army. I knew him years ago. And the Englishman William, sir, is Sir Robert Stannard. But why are all the plantation workers gathered around them? Well, you'll, you'll see in a moment, sir. Uh, they've seen you. They'll begin the ceremony now. Ceremony? Where's Lord Willoughby? Well, he, he's gone back to England, sir. The government took his land from him. I don't know the way. And in the war settlement, it's now being traded to Holland for a great tract of land in North America. In a war settlement? Uh, then the war is over. Aye, sir. That's what the ceremony is for. Blow out the British flag! Hoist the flag of Holland! Oh, 
Here's your Wolf Van Gilder. Good morning. Good morning, General Van Dyke. Uh, may I present uh, Captain Van Gilder, Sir Robert Stanhope? Uh, good morning. Were you in time for our ceremony? Yes, but if it hadn't been for Hendon here, I might have been hidden in a mongrel swamp, thinking it was a battle. I didn't know the war was over. <laughs> uh, uh, shall we send for drinks to celebrate the signing of the peace treaty? By all means. Uh, Mr. Stanhope, what territory in North America was it we gave you for this part of Guiana? It was called New Netherlands. Oh, I know it well. Did the treaty also include the city of New Amsterdam? Indeed it did. But of course, the names have been changed. Uh -huh. uh, what are they called now? Uh, the city of New Amsterdam has been rechristened New York in honor of the king's son, the Duke of York. <laughs> I think old Dutchmen will be well content with the exchange, don't you, Van Gilder? <laughs> Quite content, gentlemen, I'm <laughs> sure. Everyone in Holland was glad to be rid of your... Uh, New York. It will never amount to anything in comparison with this rich country of Kiana. Yeah, no, you are right. <laughs> Back and forth through the years, the lands of British and Dutch Guiana passed in trade and in the settlement of a dozen wars. But meanwhile, on the northeastern tip of the country... The French had established a settlement for royalists, exiled during the Revolution. In 1852, Devil's Island, just off the coast, became a penal colony for incorrigible French prisoners. Month after month, the prison ships landed their miserable cargoes. Disease, unbelievable degradation, man-killing labor took their toll of wretched lives. Death, the only way of escape, was welcomed by these hopeless outcasts. Forty years passed during which the island's very name became synonymous throughout the world with humanity at its lowest ebb. 1894. The prison ship has landed one more load of desperate men. One by one, they are brought before the commandant. Sentenced to the court of Toulouse for the crime of murder, huh? Uh, put him in number four. Yes, Captain. Next prisoner. Your name? Alfred Dreyfus. Uh, oh, yes. Here are the commitment papers. Mm. Captain of artillery, sentenced for treason. Of which I am innocent, monsieur. You were tried, were you not? Yes, but the evidence, those letters were forgeries. That's very easy to say. But it is true. I tell you I had nothing to do with those letters. They're not concerned with anything that preceded your sentence. Justice has undoubtedly been done you. What mockery! I tell you I am innocent. Why should I sell the figures of France to German agents? Put this one in number three. And if you have it in your mind to make trouble among the others because you pretend you've been unjustly sentenced, I'll soon show you that. See that he passes by the punishment cells. I have no idea of making trouble, monsieur. Get out! <laughs> What's the matter with you, my fine captain of artillery? Nothing. He thinks he's too good for us. Oh, no, of course I don't. I, I'm the same as all of you. Why do you never speak? Every night when we're brought here, you sit alone and say nothing. Uh, I tell you that I must constantly go over the scenes of my trial and wonder what I might have done to prove myself innocent. We all say that when we first come to Devil's Island. But now I wish I'd killed and robbed ten men instead of five. I might have had a taste of life before I came to this hell. Island! Island! If you have been condemned unjustly, you should be willing to join us in our plan to escape. Escape? Silence. Would you betray us to the guard? There's no hope for us here. We must go on and on, working on the roads and uh, the sugar cane until we die. And in this place, that'll be soon. But I must not attempt to escape. My wife and my brother are working in France for me. They have interested Emile Zola and other writers on my behalf. Soon the government will be made to see... I am innocent. Sir, this heat or some foul disease or the flogging will kill you long before anything can be done to save you. Even if you are innocent, you would be wise to join us. But you will only die in the jungle. How can you think you will escape? Oh. I thought I heard you talking of escape. Why, oh, you are mistaken. I, I heard you. I was... Encouraging these other men to plan an escape through the jungle. Stand up. Come with me. We were good medicine for the plotting sickness. Twenty lashes. Four years pass. Four years of horror and agony. 
during which the wife and brother of Alfred Dreyfus work unceasingly to free him. All France is aroused. The people riot in the streets. Government officials lose their offices. At last, in September 1899, the most famous prisoner ever held by Devil's Island embarks once more for France to be retried. The Dreyfus case has made the name of French Guiana known throughout the world. Pardoned, restored to his rank in the army, Alfred Dreyfus never saw the island again. Today, Guiana remains one of the last unexplored regions in the world. Its untapped wealth in gold, in rare and valuable woods, medicinal plants, precious stones, every year draws adventurers to challenge death for possession of its secrets. And still no one but the savage jungle men know whether the golden city of El Dorado really exists or is only another legend of the vanished past. Once more, our steamer awaits us in Georgetown Harbor. As we pass through the city, the markets are bright with exotic flowers of every hue, fragrant with the scent of great mounds of oranges and pineapples offered for sale by shy, black-eyed descendants of the people who watch Sir Walter Raleigh's strange ships drop anchor to change the history of their race. We are homeward bound once more from another journey to Ports of Call. you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.